Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, so I gave the information for the material. So again, have a look at the material. You can start downloading all the material now. It's again on the Dropbox and on the website. Um, and what I'll start with now, and this is the link actually, um, you have the link there. I'll start with just basic notations about random variables and distribution because we'll be using that notation and that language as we go along in the course. So the first page I'll do is actually part of chapter one. Um, but chapter one has, I think, 15 pages. It's a recap on probability theory, and I'm not going to go over all of this. So have a look at chapter one if you're not familiar or you want to refresh um, uh, your material on probability theory. So here I'm just going to make a summary of what I'll be covering. And what I have mostly is I'll be talking about random variable. And the notation, the classic notation that we use in mathematics is that you have a capital letter for the random variable, and you have a lowercase letter for the value. So this is the random variable, and here you have the value. And the value can be in some set, and so maybe the set, actually, this will be the set of values. So a random variable is a, and as the name said, this is the variable that takes some values at random. So we need a probability distribution to describe what are the different probabilities for the different values. So we have a probability distributions. If the random variable is discrete, it takes a discrete number of values, then you really have the probability that the random, random variable takes on some value x, small x. If the random variable is a continuous random variable, then we have a probability density. And so now we don't talk about the probability that you have a certain value, but we have the probability density for that value. We also write sometimes the probability density as something like this. Okay, so I think many of you are familiar with this. Then I'll continue with some notation. The next thing we need to know is the expectation. So the expectation is, is the, the mean or the expected value. So the expected value of some random variable x. This will be the sum over the values, values, and then the probability. Or if you're dealing with a continuous random variable, then it's the value, density, and then you do the integral with respect to x over the set of possible values. You can do also an expectation over any function of the random variable. I'm not going to write this. This is in the notes. And then what we'll use all, often is the variance of x. The variance of x is the expectation of x squared minus the square of the mean, so the expectation of x. So that's the variance. And I'll just finish with an example, maybe the most common random variable that we use in physics, but also in mathematics and in statistics is the Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian distribution, as I think you know, is a distribution that has a mean and a variance. The variance is that sigma squared there, and it's the bell-shaped distribution with x minus the mean squared two sigma squared. And this is for all the real values. And the shape of this, as I think you know, is the bell-shaped distribution centered at mu. The width is more or less sigma. So this is p of x, the function of x. The expectation is that mu here, and the variance is the sigma squared. Okay, everything is good, I think so. Okay, so again, this is, this is all the notation I want to start with. I'll introduce some more notations as we go along, but I don't want to do a full recap of probability theory. Again, have a look at chapter one in the lecture notes for the Markov course. And again, you have the full kind of recap of what you would need in, in terms of probability theory. Uh, to follow the course. But this is really what we need. The notion of random variable, distributions, and so on. Okay, I'm gonna erase now. Um, you have, except for the first few boards that I'll be writing, 
then you have all the notes. So I'll be quite quick actually about writing and erasing. But so the first few boards, I think the two first boards actually are not in the notes, but after that, it's all in the notes. So I think I can go quickly on this. So I'm gonna just erase this. You have erased this, you have the link already. Okay, now what I want to give you now is a kind of direction of where we're going, um, assuming that you're from physics. So if, you, if you're a physicist, if you're a physics student, I'm pretty sure that you've seen quantum mechanics and then you've seen quite a lot of quantum mechanics. And what I want to show you now is what we'll be doing compared to quantum mechanics. There's a lot of overlap actually between Markov processes and quantum mechanics and the way that the theories are linear theory. This is what I want to explain. The first thing that I want to mention is that what we'll be doing is actually talking about stochastic processes. And a stochastic process is just a random variable as it is a function of time. So we have a random state, we have a state that evolves in time. So you think like differential equations, you think like mechanics, you have a state as a function of time. But the difference with classical mechanics is that that x now is not a little x. It's not a value that is parameterized with time. It's a random variable that is parameterized with time. And that's a stochastic process. What we'll see specifically is Markov processes. And then we'll get to see what is so different with Markov processes. But I want, what I want to discuss now is um, quantum mechanics versus Markov. So um, I have quantum mechanics on this side, and I have Markov on this side. Now, when we start with, with the Markov process is that we have a state that evolves with time. And there's nothing actually equivalent in quantum mechanics. You cannot write, I think, as you know, the components or the coordinate of a particle in quantum mechanics. What we have instead is the wave function that gives us the probability amplitude for a particle to be at the point X at the time T. And then for Markov processes, what that will correspond to is a probability density for the process to be at the state or the coordinate X at the time T. So what you play with in quantum mechanics is the wave function. What we play with in Markov process is the probability density for the process itself. Now there's an evolution, there's an evolution equation for the wave function. That's the Schrodinger equation. So we can write the evolution equation for the wave function is the Schrodinger equation. And what's interesting about this equation is that it's a linear equation. The time evolution of the wave function is some operator, which we know is the Newtonian, applied to the wave function. But if you come in that from mathematics, you don't need to know that this is the energy function. You just see this and then you see a linear equation, a linear evolution equation. That's interesting because for a classical Markov process, the evolution of the density is also a linear equation, is some operator that will apply onto the probability density. And what I'll do in the course is to explain why we have that structure, how we have that structure, and what is that G here? That G is what we call the generator. That's the equivalent of the Newtonian. It's not the energy function, but it's an operator in the same sense as this is an operator in quantum mechanics. Okay, we can go deeper in the analogy because here we can write what is the solution? The solution, because we have a linear equation, is the initial wave function and then we apply what we call the propagator and the propagator as i think you've seen is the exponential of the hamiltonian divided here by h bar so we can write the formal solution to this linear equation it's this solution and this is what we call the propagator and in markup we have the same because we have a linear equation so the distribution in time is given explicitly by the initial distribution. And now here we're gonna have the exponential of the generator times T. So we see there's a very close relationship and that comes because again, we have a linear evolution equation. And then you can build more, um, more similarities because if you have a linear equation, you can build a, um, an eigenfunction expansion, you can do, you can use spectral analysis to 
write down the evolution in terms of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and then we'll, we, we won't have time to do this. But the last point, which is actually the main difference between quantum mechanics and Markov processes, is that, as you know, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So if you take the Hermitian of the complex conjugate of H, then it's the same as H. And that in quantum mechanics is very important because it guarantees that the eigenvalues, the energies, are real. For Markov processes, we don't have this. If you take the adjoint or the complex conjugate, which is the transpose of the generator, you don't get in general that they're the same. Okay, so here we're dealing with non emission evolution, and then we'll get to see why we have this. Okay, so we have a linear structure, and what I would want to emphasize actually this week is the fact that we have that linear structure. And I think it's useful as a pedagogical tool because if you know quantum mechanics already, then in a way you know the theory of Markov processes because you can build on this. It's got the same structure, well, very similar structure. And then some stuff that you know already in quantum mechanics, you can transpose this onto Markov process. Okay. What I'll do now, uh, what I'll do today is to start on this structure using Markov chains. And then in the course of the week, then we'll just expand on this structure. We'll see exactly the same structure for jump processes, for stochastic differential, stochastic differential equations, and then different type of Markov processes. And all of these Markov processes are different depending on whether the state is discrete or continuous and whether the evolution is discrete or continuous. So there are basically four types of Markov processes that you can imagine because the state, as I said, can be here discrete or continuous. And time itself can be discrete or continuous. And each of the four now combinations of discrete and continuous will define a different Markov process which evolves in a different way. So for instance, if you have a continuous state that evolves continuously in time, then you have something like run in motion. It evolves continuously in time in a continuous space. And this will be the subject of stochastic differential equations that we'll see on Thursday. If you have something that is discrete and evolves in continuous time, then you have a discrete state for some amount of time, and then you do a random jump somewhere else, random jump somewhere else, random jump somewhere else, in continuous time, and this is what we call a jump process. We have a discrete set of possible states, like levels, but the evolution is continuous in time, and that's a jump process. We'll see this tomorrow. What I'll start with today is a mock of chain and a Markov chain, what the Markov chain is, is that it's a state that evolves in discrete time. So you have a discrete state, and then after one unit of time, you're going somewhere else, you jump randomly somewhere else. After one unit of time, you jump somewhere else, and then so on. And this is the time end. So time is discrete, and state is discrete, and that's a Markov chain. And then this is what I want to cover today. Okay, so I'll start on Markov chain. Markov chain is the subject of chapter two in the lecture notes. Um, there's a lot of material in chapter two. Today I'll cover only some subset of sections. I'll tell you which sections I'm covering in chapter two. And um, there'll be some exercises there. Actually, it's in the checklist, so you can have a look there. And then actually on Friday, when we cover some numerical aspects of Markov chain, we'll come back to chapter two, because for instance, I'll cover Markov chain, Monte Carlo methods, I'll cover uh, sampling, and this is also part of chapter two. So for now, I'll just cover the basic stuff in chapter two about Markov chains. Tomorrow, we'll see jump processes, and then stochastic differential equations, then simulations, and then we'll have other topics on Friday. Okay, so I'm looking at a question now uh, from Surav. Is there anything analog analogous to a phase of a wave function in the Markov process? And the answer is no, because uh, this is a good question. Phi here in quantum mechanics is a complex object. So this is complex, but here the distribution is real. 
This is the probability density to be at x at time t. This is a real number, uh, uh, so it's real. It doesn't have any phase, okay? And that's a, that's a big difference. Uh, and so that, that's also a kind of distinguished feature between Markov and quantum mechanics. But the main point, again, is that linear evolution and the fact that you have a generator to tell you what the evolution is, okay? Good. Okay, so let me start on Markov chains. I'll erase this. Okay, so I'm taking my notes now mm, 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 of chapter two. I'm back here. And I'm going to start with the first section here, mark of chain. Uh, and I'm going to use the section numbers of the chapter. I'll think that will be less confusing than if I actually come up with other sections um, numbers. So what I'll do is define a bit of Markov chain terminology, and then I'll go through some examples. And then what we'll see today is the evolution equation for the Markov chains. Um, and I think we'll do the full hour and a half. I'm not gonna take a break because I think uh, with the introduction, I want to go through some materials, but again, we can answer some questions after. And then um, if you have any questions about the exercises, then you can reach me. We can organize this actually after the lecture. So I see now it's been half an hour. I think we'll be doing an hour of material. And then after that, we can discuss how we go forward this week with the exercises and the material. Okay, so I'm in chapter two on Markov chains. Markov chains are kind of nice to begin with because you have that discrete time and discrete state. So it makes the understanding of what a Markov process is in an easier way, but it's not the most interesting type of process, but for, for teaching purpose, it's quite nice. So I have 2.2 and that's the definition of a Markov chain. So I'm gonna have a definition here. I have a certain trajectory. So I have a bunch of states. Time goes from one to N. Okay, so you can see this actually, I shouldn't use the curly brackets. I should use the, the round bracket. This is just a sequence of random variable. Okay, and that sequence of, of random variable will say is a Markov chain, is a Markov chain if the probability of the different states and time has a particular structure which is you have the probability of the first one and then you have the probability of, sorry, two given one, three given two, and then you multiply all the way down to xn, and then you have the conditional probability of the one previous. So this is the defining feature of the Markov chain. What you have to imagine is that you have these states in time from one to n, and the probability for the second state in time depends on the previous state. And this is what you have. So the joint probability of x1, x2, all the way to xn is you first set the probability for the initial state, which is x1, and then you have the probability of x2 given one. So this is a kind of transition. This is the Markov property. The probability depends of the next state depends only on the previous state. So then the probability of x3 given x2, probability of xn given x minus one. So that's a Markov chain, okay? The way that I define it in the notes actually is, this is equivalent to If you look at the probability of xn, and then you have all the previous states before, that probability does not depend on everything before, it only depends on the one before. So the probability of xn, the probability of reaching the state x at times n, only depends on the previous one. 
Okay, and then you can you can you can repeat this. It means that the knowledge of the state it depends only on the knowledge of the previous state. So that that's a markup check. What we have here is a conditional probability that we call also the transition probability. Okay, so this will be um, yeah. We have the transition probability transition. So this transition probability is what defines the Markov chain. So for a different model, you'll have different transition probabilities. So we're going to write that transition probability in the following way. The probability to reach a certain state J at time N, given that you start at a state I at time N minus 1, we're going to write this as pi ij. And the reason we're going to do this is because we want to get to that linear structure of the theory, and then we'll do this by writing everything in terms of matrices. And it makes sense because this is the probability to go from i to j in one time step. So I'm in i at the time n minus 1, and at the time n, I jump to the state j, so I do a transition from i to j. This depends on two indices, so it's a matrix. Pi i j. So the i will come first to j, so we're going from i to j. Just remember this. Sometimes we also write the transition matrix with a big P with P i j. So then we have that big matrix, which is a, it will have some size depending on the size of your state. So if this is the state space, this is the size of the state space. It will be a this cardinality times this cardinality matrix. And moreover, because this is a probability, if you sum over all these states, you have to get one because this is a probability. So if you sum on j of pi ij, you have to get one for all i. So wherever you sit at the state i, this is a probability to reach j. So if you sum over all the possible j's, it has to sum to 1. And then this property is very important. It's what we call the stochastic property of the transition matrix. It just makes sure that you're dealing with probability. OK? OK. And now the important point is that you really have to see this as a matrix. So what I'm going to do a lot is write the matrix notation. Pi is a matrix. It's the matrix of what? You have to realize that it's a matrix of the elements ij. So if I write this in terms of matrix, I have here pi 1, 1. This is the probability of going from the state 1 and to the state 1. So this is the probability of remaining in the state 1. This here, element will be 1, 2. This is the probability of going from the state 1 to the state 2, and then so on. Here now is the probability that you are in the state 2, and then you jump to the state 1. Here is the probability to remain in the state 2, and then so on. And so you have that big matrix that describes all the jump probabilities between the different states that you have. And here, these states, I'm going to number them actually 1, 2, 3, 4, but they could be A, B, C, D, anything. You just have a discrete set of states, and then in order to define the Markov chain, you have to define all the probabilities of jumping between those states. Okay. I should say that if you take a textbook in physics, and that textbook has any information about Markov chain, usually the indices are switched. So, the probability to reach j from i is usually denoted as pi j i. So instead of summing over j here to get 1, instead of summing over the different uh, columns, you're going to sum over the different rows in order to get 1. But that's, that's a different convention that physicists use. The convention I'm using here is um, the mass convention used. So maybe if I can put some colors here. See that i here, the first i, is the row index, and the j is the column index. So when you do the sum over j to get 1, it means that when you sum over the column index, 
then when you sum here, you get one. So the rows sum to one. If you follow the physics conventions, the columns will be summing to one. That's a, a small thing. Okay. The one thing that we need now to define a Markov chain is that we have that transition matrix. And I can write also the transition matrix like this. Pi ij is the probability to have a jump from i to j. So often I'll be using that notation. This is very subjective. They're suggest su suggestive. It shows that it's really the probability to go from i to j. And with this, now we can also put a graphical representation of the Markov chain because what you can do is that you can put all the different states of your Markov chain. So suppose you have three states in the Markov chain, one, two, three, then you can put arrows to say where you can jump. So you have arrows like this, maybe I put this. So this will be pi one, two. It's the probability to go from the state one to the state two. This is the self arrow is the probability to remain at one. So that's the probability to go from one and to go at one. So it's the probability to remain at one. This will be pi three, three. And this will be pi two, three. So maybe these are the only non-zero probabilities so in that case, you're going to have here some number pi 1, 1, pi 1, 2. You have a 0 here. There's, no, there's nothing that goes to 1. There's nothing. Here you have pi 2, 3. There's nothing here. There's nothing here. And pi 3, 3. So this will be the pi matrix corresponding to the diagram. So the diagram is very useful because it gives a picture of what the Markov chain is. And these will be numbers, of course. So these are probabilities. It's a matrix of probabilities. So each of the elements here is between 0 and 1. And if you look at a given row, then the elements sum to 1. That's the normalization of probabilities. Okay. When you have those properties for that matrix, this matrix pi is called a stochastic matrix. It describes a Markov chain. Good. I think I'll continue. Let me show an example, in fact. So I'll... Basic example of this will be a two-state Markov chain. Maybe you have a state that we're going to call 0. There's a state that we call 1. We could also call the state A and B, 1, 2, anything. But it's, it's, it's quite common to actually call them 0 and 1. In general, you have a probability from going from 0 to 1. Then you're going to have a probability, say, beta to go from 1 to 0. By normalization, here you have to have minus 1 beta, and here you have to have 1 minus alpha. So if I write the matrix pi, I have 1 minus alpha. This is from 0 to 1. I have beta, 1 minus beta. Now here you see the stochastic property if I sum on a row, 1 minus alpha plus alpha, it's 1. Beta plus 1 minus beta, it's 1. So this is a stochastic matrix if alpha is between 1, 0, and 1, because it's a probability, and beta has to be also between 0 and 1. This can describe in physics um, to a two-level system where you have an excited energy and a ground state energy. And then you have some kind of light, maybe it coming lines like a laser. And then you can take a electron up to some excited energy. And then the jump will be done with some probability. And then it can come back to the ground state to emit some photon. And then that transition will also happen with some probability. It's a random process. And you can describe this in a semi-classical way using a Markov chain. Okay, so this is a two-state Markov chain. It's the most basic Markov chain you can imagine, because of course, if you have a one-state Markov chain, there's no transition possible. So this is a the trivial Markov chain. So the next, the simplest example now is a two-state Markov chain. We'll often use the two-state Markov chain to um, just illustrate some basic things about Markov chains, but also in the exercises, there's some exercises about Markov chain. There's a question from Jean-Francois. Could you recall us the password to have access to the material? The password is 
Python, the language Python is great. Yes, it's there. So Sumia has, 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 has put it in the discussion. That's the password. Um, the reason why I have a password is because I'm reusing the exercises from one year to another with my own students. So I don't want all these solutions to diffuse. So try to keep those solutions for yourself as uh, teaching material and then useful material for you, but try not to diffuse them too much and try not to you know, try not to diffuse the password too much. Population inversion related to a Markov chain. Yes, um, it's not an example that I'll cover in great detail, but it is in a way, <coughs> of course, population inversion related to laser is a quantum mechanical process, but it can be described in some semi-classical way using Markov. Uh, processes exactly like this. If you have a two level system, you can see population inversion as being an excited process that takes some particle electrons to an excited state with some probability. And then the inversion happens when the electron goes back to the ground state and releases some energy, some photon, and this will happen with some probability. So this is inherently a two state Markov chain. If you see this in time, it would mean that the electron is some, can start with the ground state and then after some time can maybe stay in the ground state, maybe stay in the ground state. And then at some point we'll reach the excited state, we'll stay in the excited state, and then maybe jump back to the ground state. So you have to see this as a kind of stroboscopic picture of what the state of the system is in discrete time. It's either in the ground state or the excited state with some probability, and there's a jump probability between the two states. Okay, here's another example. <clears throat> Uh, population process. This is also something quite relevant. It's relevant with COVID. Population model. One of the most basic population model that you can imagine is a bunch of integers representing the population number all the way, say, to infinity or to n, if you have a finite capacity for the population. And then you have possible jumps between the population numbers. So you can have a birth with some probability. So a birth will take you from population number, say, two to three. That's a birth of one individual. And then you have deaths, and deaths will be related to a, an individual dying with probability beta. So the probability of having a birth will be alpha, and the probability to have a death will be beta. And by normalization, you can stay, the population can stay at some number with probability one minus alpha minus beta. And this will be the same for every state. Now, of course, the probability could change from one population to number to another, but this is the simplest model where the probability of a death or the probability of a birth is the same regardless of the number of individuals you have. So this is a basic population model. It's not really good, actually, if you want to, pop to, to model uh, epidemics or even the population growth, uh, but it, it is a Markov process. So if you want to write the pi matrix, then the pi matrix in that case will be an infinite matrix, right? Because you have an infinite number of states. In the diagonal, you have your one minus alpha minus beta. That's in the diagonal. The birth actually takes you from one level to a level higher, so you have alpha here, and then, uh, sorry, here will be one minus alpha. Then you have a bunch of zeros here. Here you have beta for dying, alpha, so the upper diagonal is alpha, and then the lower diagonal is beta, and then you have the normalization line. Okay, so you can represent a Markov process that has an infinite number of state. The Markov matrix, in that case, you can write it down. It's just an infinite matrix. It's a bit, you know, infinite dimension matrix, but you can write it down. It's fine. So this also models cues, um, random walks. We'll see random walks um, later. Um, and when we get to jump processes, we'll see variation of that model is actually more relevant because the different rates, the different probabilities for having a birth or a death will actually depend on the number of people. This is not actually, um, yeah, we'll get back to this actually at some point. There's a question, is it correct to say that the transition probability also evolve with time or as we move along the Markov chain? This is a good question, which I actually haven't discussed. 
when, when we, just to answer that question, when we write the, the transition probability of going from I to J, I will always assume in the course that that probability does not change with time. But you could imagine a transition matrix that does change with time. It would mean that the initial probabilities are not the same as the probabilities down the line. So that's, that is a possibility. But to simplify the whole course, I will always assume that the probabilities for the jumps do not explicitly depend on time. They only depend on the states where you are and the state that you want to reach. So this will describe a jump from time n minus one to n to n, but this probability is the same for all n. So I have a random variable at time n minus one. I'm in the state i. And what is the probability to rate to reach the state j for the later time? This will be pi i j. We will assume that this does not depend on time explicitly. So it does not depend on that index n, n minus one. So this is the same for all n. This approximation or this assumption, it's called the time homogeneous assumption. Um, is either homogeneous or time homogeneous or time independent Markov chain. So this is the assumptions that we make. It just makes the presentations of everything easier. Okay, good. Okay, so th th these are basically notations or definition of what the Markov chain is, but what we want to calculate is how the probabilities evolve in time. So what you have to, maybe I'll just, it's easier if I, if I write what I'm gonna explain now. I'm just gonna erase this. What I want now is an evolution equation for probabilities. Okay, so what I have, and this is section 2.3, this is called a probability So one way to picture a Markov chain is really like a dynamical system. And this will appeal to what you know about physics and the evolution of physical system. So you have an initial state, and then you have a, position, a possible transition to a second state, and then you have a possible transition to a third state, and then so on, all the way to some final time n. So you have to specify what will be the initial distribution for the first state. And what you want to calculate is the probability to reach the different values of the second state. So you want the probability distribution now at time two. And then we want to repeat this to get what is the possible probability distribution for the time three and then so on. And this, is what you need now to describe your system because the system evolves in a stochastic way. So it reaches different values at random. And what you want is the distribution for all these values in time. So that index really here is the time, and this is the state. So this is a trajectory. It's a discrete time trajectory, and I want to get the evolution of the distribution for each of the states. Okay. Now, in the course, normally what I do is that I derive what that evolution equation is. But now, with the time that we have, what I'll do is I will only um, put the evolution equation and then we'll describe some properties of it and what it means. Before this is a question, is pi invertible always? If yes, do we know? And it does have a relationship with the process. Um, the pi inverse actually has no meaning here. Okay, and then we'll get to see. It's not something that we'll always play with. So pi indeed is a matrix. So you might think, oh, can I take the inverse of pi? You could in principle. I think you can in, in many cases, but it doesn't have any meaning for us. Okay. So the evolution equation, so that's the evolution equation. I'm just going to write it, and I'll write it in two different ways. I'll write it in what it means first, which is that the probability of the state at time n plus one, so that's the probability to reach j, this is given by the sum 
over i of the probability that m at i times the transition probability i i j. Okay, so this guy here is at time n. This guy here is at time n plus one. So this is an evolution equation where if I know the distribution at n, then I know the distribution at time n plus one. And the way I get that distribution is that I sum over i by putting here the pi ij. Now, if you look at this, this is a matrix product. It's nothing but a matrix product. So to put this uh, more obvious, what I'll do is I'll introduce a vector notation, pn. pn is the vector of the p n x i. Okay, so it's the list of all the probabilities at time n. Pi itself, we know, is that matrix of elements pi ij. If you have this, then I can write that the vector of probabilities at time n plus 1 is the vector of probabilities at time n times and that's the evolution equation. You see, it's a linear equation because I take a vector. This is a row vector, by the way, right? So um, I should write that down. This is now a row vector. So this is row, row, and then you have a matrix. So what you have indeed is something like a row vector containing the probabilities. It's a row vector containing the probability times the matrix pi that you have here. Okay? But the main point again is that you have a linear equation. Probability vector times matrix as a row times matrix gives you the probability vector as a row vector for the time n plus one. In the probabilities, it's a row. Yes. Okay. This is the evolution equation. So with this now, what can I do? Well, again, I'm going to fix P1. This is the vector containing all the probabilities for the different states at time one. And then at time two, to get the probability vector, I'm going to multiply P1 by pi. This is one step of the iteration for the evolution equation. Then I can continue like this at time three. All I need to do is take p2 multiplied by pi. But now I can use actually this one. So this is p1 and I apply pi twice. So you see where I'm going. I can also write the evolution equation for the time n as, or n plus one, as p1 and then I apply pi n times. So this is the solution, if you want, of the evolution equation. This is the evolution equation for one time step. This is the, evo the evolution equation for n time steps. And it all depends on the initial distribution that you put. So depending on the model that you consider, you're going to have some initial probability vector describing the, the, the probability to start in some values. And then with this evolution equation, you can get the probability of reaching any state in time at later time using this. OK? And then you have that linear theory for the calculations of probability. Okay, let me go through an example and then I'll just finish with what actually we're close to finishing. So I think to finish, I'll just mention one last thing. So this equation is really what I want to present. And this is the equation for Markov chain. We'll see a different equation for jump processes, but actually I've got an hour and a half. So I actually have Another half hour, right? Okay. So I've got time. So let me let me show an example. As an example, I'll just uh, discuss the the two by two uh, matrix, so the the two state Markov chain. So let's have a look at that. Here, it's the two state Markov chain. So that's the chain that I presented before. I have zero. I have two states, zero and one alpha for the jump probabilities from zero to one, beta for the probabilities of jumping from one to zero, 
and then my normalization, I have these one minus alpha, one minus beta. So again, the pi, one minus alpha, alpha, beta, one minus beta here. Okay, here I have two states. So the vector of probabilities will be a uh, one by two vector. So if I want to get the probability at n plus one for the state zero, this is the vector. So n plus one, that's the time. So that's my p n plus one. Okay. I have two states, so the, the vector of probabilities is just a one by two vector. It's a row vector. We're always playing with row vectors here. This will be given by the probability vector at the previous time. So this is my Pn. And then here I'm going to have pi, and pi is 1 minus alpha, alpha, beta, 1 minus beta. So if I do the matrix product, what I'll get is that in order to reach the state 0 at time n plus 1, it's 1 minus alpha Pn 0 plus beta Pn 1, which makes sense because if the probability to reach that state at n plus 1 is either I was there before and I stay with probability 1 minus alpha, or I was at the state 1 before and I jump with probability beta. So this is really what's happening. You have something similar for the state 1. The probability to be in state 1 at time n plus 1 is either I was in the state 0 and I do a jump with probability alpha and then I end up in state 1 and n plus 1, or I was already in state 1 and I stayed there with probability 1 minus beta. Okay, so you see that even from the graphics, from the graphical representation of the Markov chain, you could actually make up the evolution equation just by looking at the different jumps. The probability of reaching a certain state is you coming from all the other states to that state, but this is all encoded in the evolution equation, and that's the evolution equation values. Okay, so it's actually simpler to just write the matrix phi and then write the evolution equation as a matrix equation. Okay. Okay, so that, that fixes the idea. In the coursework, there's some um, exercises actually about uh, writing down the Markov chain, writing down the matrix pi, and then um, writing, uh, finding the solutions to the evolution equation. Now, this is actually, it doesn't look so bad as an equation, but this equation, either for the n step or for one step, is actually a difficult equation to solve in general because it depends on the initial distribution, but it also depends on the pi. So it depends on the kind of model that you have. Um, if you have three states, then this will be a three by three matrix, but you have to imagine if you have a large system with many states, then that matrix pi is quite big. And so solving this equation, even though it's linear, can be quite a long task. And in many cases in physics, we have a simplification because when n goes to infinity, we have a kind of stationary behavior. So the system looks more and more time independent. And these Markov chains are called ergodic Markov chains. And these are the main chains that we'll actually see. So I think I'll finish with this. I'll present what an ergodic Markov chain is, and then we'll see some examples. Okay, so um, let me erase this now. So again, the, the main models that are used in physics are ergodic Markov chain. And this is the subject of 2.5, ergodic Markov So there are two things that we need for an ergodic Markov chain. We need a stationary distribution, and we need a limiting distribution. So, a stationary distribution is a, a distribution that doesn't change when you apply a pi. So depending on pi, sometimes you can choose a distribution and then you do the evolution of the distribution and that distribution does not change. So we call this a stationary distribution. 
Okay. There could be many stationary distribution for Markov chain. There could be no stationary distribution sometimes for Markov chain. It depends on pi, and this is a linear algebra problem. For a given pi, do you have any spatial distribution? This is actually an eigen, um, an eigen vector question because if you have a spatial distribution, you see it's an eigen vector for the matrix pi with eigenvalue one. Okay, then you have limiting distribution. A limiting distribution is a distribution that is a kind of converges point. So we have that pi n, that p n, and the p n can go when n goes to infinity to some p infinity that we call the limiting distribution. This is the limit. This is the limit. This we call the limiting distribution. And our, an ergodic Markov process is a very special Mark, uh, Markov process that has one spatial distribution that happens to be the limiting distribution. So this is actually a result. If I n from n to from i, sorry, i from one to n is an ergodic Markov chain, then the time dependent distribution goes to a P star which is unique. So if you start with your P1, so what that means is that if you start with P1 and then you calculate P2 as P1 pi, and then you repeat this to get Pn as Pn minus one pi, then as you do the product, the Pn becomes more and more and more less the same. And so Pn goes to, in the limit when n goes to infinity, to that p star, which is a eigenvector, is the unique eigenvector of pi. And this is true for all initial distribution p1. And p star is such that it's a fixed point of pi. It's an eigenvector of pi. OK? And this is useful because it shows that the process, if, if you started at some point, will actually evolve towards a stationary distribution in time, which does not depend on the initial distribution that you choose. So this is a choice here. This is the choice of initial distribution. And as time evolves, the P1 goes to a certain Pn that doesn't in, on time anymore. It, it, it converges to the stationary distribution. Many stochastic processes and physics actually will have that property to be ergodic. Okay, and these are the ones that I'll focus mostly on. Good. Let's do an example. I'll do it here. Let me go back again to that two state Markov chain. Example, if I go back to that two state Markov chain, alpha, beta, one minus alpha for that one, one minus alpha, one minus beta for that one. If alpha is not one or zero and beta is not one or zero, then the P star here is beta over alpha plus beta and alpha over alpha plus beta. So how do I get this? Well, I write the matrix pi. I use some uh, linear algebra to find the eigenvector of pi. And it has to be the left eigenvector, right? So this is very important. Pi star is pi star as a row vector. So it's multiplied on the left side of pi. If you use any kind of mathematical software like Mathematica or Maple and try to calculate the eigenvector of a matrix, they, they will always give you the eigenvectors on the right of a matrix, not on the left of the matrix. So the pi star is a left eigenvector of pi, which means that it will be 
a wide eigenvector of pi transpose. Okay, so keep this in mind. Okay, so this is the in the unique left eigenvector of eigenvalue one of pi. You can verify this. And so this is the station distribution. So in the long time limit, the process will actually populate the state zero with probability beta over alpha plus beta and will populate, will have a probability to reach the state one to be alpha over alpha plus beta. And it makes sense because you always have that propensity of reaching state one with alpha. So the probability of occupying the state one is proportional to alpha, whereas the probability to occupy the state zero in the long time limit will be proportional to beta. Okay, and again, what that means is that this is the P star represents the probability, the long time probability of occupying some state. So, and this is a vector. So, if I look at that vector, I have the long time occupation of the first state, the long time occupation of the second state, and then so on, all the way to the long time occupation of the last state, which could be anything. And the sum of this, of course, is one because I have a probability vector. So the sum of all these probabilities have to be one. And these are the long time probabilities of occupying the different values of the random variable or the different states of the Markov chain. There's a question here. Doesn't the stochastic property imply that the existence of at least a stationary distribution? The answer is no. So for pi, when pi is always stochastic, right? Like because pi represents, pi contains all the conditional probabilities, but they, they, they are Markov chains that are not, that don't have a station distribution. And I'll, I'll put an example here. So consider as an example, the two state Markov chain, zero and one, and then you can jump with probability one here, and you can jump with probability one. The pi matrix for this is just the kind of reversing matrix like this. This doesn't have a stationary distribution. It's not ergodic. If you start here, you always go on here, here, and then you just like switch between the states. So it depends where you start with. And so there's no stationary distribution here. Uh, there's no ergodicity at all either. Okay, so the fact that the pi here is stochastic, the rho sum to one, but there's no stationary distribution. So the existence of a stationary distribution will depend on this, okay? And here's another one. Right now I have an infinite number of stationary distribution, same two state markup chain, but now there's no jump possible. If you start on a state, you stay there. Pi in this case is the identity matrix, and this one has an infinite number of stationary state. I can start anywhere in terms of initial probabilities, and I'm going to stay there because pi applied to anything will give you the same vector. So here I have an infinite number of stationary distribution. This is not ergodic. So this is why here to be ergodic, I put alpha to be z different from zero and different from one, and beta has to be different from zero and different from, from one. When you have this, you have a kind of mixing property that leads to the stationary distribution. If I have a bunch of zeros and ones, then this is not ergodic. But here I have no stationary distribution. Here I have an infinite number of stationary distribution. Uh, yeah, uh, can I actually clarify my question? Uh, so, uh, uh, so the uh, fact that uh, this pi matrix is stochastic means it has a right eigenvector with the eigenvalue one. So yeah. if pi, pi has eigenvalue one, so pi transpose also should have eigenvalue one. Uh, so, so that basically means that there should uh, be an eigenvector corresponding to that uh, particular eigenvalue, right? Uh, uh, so that was the argument I had. Uh, uh, to so arrive at that there should be at least one uh, stationary distribution. Uh, yeah, but you see here, this example actually shows that there are none. So, um, so uh, what it, that means? It, it has a stationary distribution, right? Like uh, one over two, one over two uh, row vector. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know you're right. So in this case, actually, sorry. So here, P star one two one two is um, this is the stationary distribution, but it's not it's not 
it's stationary, but it's not a Gaudi. It's not reached by anything, except if you start on it. Okay, okay. Thanks. Um, yes. With this property, actually, so this, this is good. It's just mentioned that if you if you look on, on right eigenvector, there's always a right eigenvector with this. In fact, the eigenvector is the one eigenvector. If you have an eigenvector which just contains one, you have that property. And this is only the stochastic nature of the Markov matrix pi, the rows sum to one. So if you want to express the fact that the so the rows sum to one, just put a bunch of one here and then do the product like this, and then you'll get one. And if you repeat this, you'll get one. So this is the stochastic nature of, of, of the of pi. Uh, and so the argument is that if you transpose this, that there, there ought to be an object also of eigenvalue one, and that's the case here. Um, but what you have to keep in mind is that pi in general is not the same as pi transpose, which means that the left eigenvectors of the matrix are not the same as the right eigenvector of the matrix. Okay, and this is very important. I guess in physics, we don't emphasize this too much because the reason why we learn linear algebra is to study quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, we have that built-in property that we're doing with emission uh, operators or emission matrices. So emission matrices, when you're dealing with real matrices, is just transpose. So in physics, in a way, we always deal with right eigenvectors that are the same as left eigenvectors. But in Markov theory, it's not the case. We don't have this. So the left eigenvectors are different from the left eigenvectors. The left eigenvectors are different from the right eigenvectors. Um, the eigenvalues are the same. So you just have to go back to linear algebra and make that distinction and see what actually is kept in linear algebra. But it's not too difficult. It's just the eigenvectors might be different, but the eigenvalues are the same. Thanks. So, Hi, uh, Hugo. I mean, uh, yep. He, yeah. So, I, I mean, uh, just a comment on this. So, I guess in this, uh, the for the first example, uh, the I mean, the second eigenvalue is probably just minus one, which means yep. that that's why I guess it uh, it will never converge to the stationary state, right? And Gordon could also say something like that. Yeah. yeah. I think it was actually, so it's part of a question from Surav. For Markov chain to be ergodic, will it be, would it suffice that the mod of all the eigenvalues of the transition except the largest one be less than one? In a sense, yes. And I think we'll get to that property at some point. If you do a spectral expansion of the linear evolution, then you have that one eigenvalue, it's always there. And if all the eigenvalues are, have modulus less than one, then you have convergence to the um, ergodic distribution. And what you're describing here is that for this particular case where you only have like reversion, then the other eigenvalue is minus one. So you don't have that property. So it's not ergodic. Then there's a question from Sushant. Can you define ergodic property one more time? Yes. So I haven't actually defined what ergodic means, right? Because I've just said that if you have an ergodic Markov chain, then the distribution, the time dependent distribution converges to a stationary distribution, which is unique. But what does it mean for a Markov chain to be ergodic? Or how, how do we know that a Markov chain is ergodic? It's all contained in, in pi. And there's quite a big theory in maths about this, and it's related to what uh, they call classification of states. And it's a big subject, it's quite abstract, it's too complicated for me. We have no time for this. I'm really glossing over really. Um, how you, you, you can verify that for a given pi, you have an ergodic Markov chain. I'm putting some references in the lecture notes, so it's there and it's, it relates to a textbook that where this is nicely explained. So if you, have, if you want more details about this, go into the lecture notes and then go into the reference and then you'll get to see um, um, all the theory about this. So again, the, 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 the term to use here is classification of states. Then you have something like transient states, ergodic states, uh, recurrent states. Uh, but again, it will take too much time for us to go into this. What I'll do is that every time I put an example, basically it will be ergodic. But then the meaning of ergodic again, think about this, is what I presented to Google. Yes. So this uh, first example is also like a deterministic system, basically, right? It's uh, it just zero goes to one and one goes to zero because you're Time is also discrete. So it's, I mean, given the initial condition, you exactly know where the system will be after n steps. Whenever you see a probability which is equal to one in yeah. the pi matrix, 
that means that you're doing the jump with probability one. So yeah. that is a deterministic jump. Okay, so that, that's a good point. So here, maybe here I can just explain what the dynamics will be for this one. The dynamics for this one will be that I have two states, a state zero, a state one. If I start at zero at time one, at time two, I'm going to the state one for sure. And then being in state one means that at the third time, I'm going to be at the state zero for sure. So I'm just oscillating between the two states. This is one possible trajectory. There's another one where if I start at one, then I'm going to go to zero. And then I'm going to go at one. So this is the other alternating sequence, but starting from the different state. So the, the only two possible trajectories here are, are either I start at zero and I go to one and then I go back, or I start at one and I go to zero and then I repeat this. So you have two alternating sequence as the possible trajectories of your system. So the system is not so much stochastic here. The stochasticness is only in the probability of choosing the initial state, but you'll have only two deterministic trajectories if you want. The other example here is the trivial example where you do not move at all. If you start at zero, you always stay at zero. If you start at one, you always stay at one. So this is also a kind of deterministic system. It's a trivial system. But if I start in the state zero with some probabilities, then I stay in that state with the same probability. So even though it's a deterministic system, I can choose an initial distribution for the two states, and then that distribution will stay the same for all the different states. So in a way, this is not ergodic because I'm not reaching a unique state in time starting from any initial distribution. The initial distribution just carries on forever. So I have an infinite number of stationary states, but it's not ergodic. Okay, and so what I wanted to say now is I want to emphasize the meaning of ergodic again because it's very important. It's the fact that starting from any initial distribution for the first time, so the initial time, so you have again your initial time. You have your initial time at one, and then you're choosing some kind of distribution for your system in time. So you have to picture this is xi, or this is xn, and this is your time n. You have time two, time three, and then so on, all the way to time n. I fix an initial distribution for the different states. And I want to see how it changes in time. And then to get to see how it changes in time, I have to apply the evolution equation using the pi. And then what I see for an ergodic system is that after some very long time, it stays the same. So if I look at the next time, it stays the same. So the different probabilities over time tend to the same probabilities. And these probabilities are just interpreted as the long time occupation probabilities of the different states. So starting from any initial distribution with time, I go to a unique stationary distribution, which is reached from any, from any initial distribution as n goes to infinity. And pi star again is an eigenvector of pi. And so if I look at that pi star, this is actually a vector. If I look at the pi star i, this is the long term occupation probability of state i. Okay, so this is very important. So if I look at any long-term time, this will be the probability of being in state i. The rest of the probabilities are contained in the p star vector. Okay. Okay. Let me finish with an example, and then uh, I can take some questions. A good example to illustrate this, which is part of the coursework, is um, the basic random walk. And the basic random walk is something very useful because we'll get to see it when we define Brownian motion and um, stochastic differential equation. So I want to present this. This is part of the applications 2.6 applications 
So that's the section that you'll see in the lecture notes, but I'm going to touch only on one application, namely the first one, random walk. The random walk, we'll take the random walk in one dimension on the integers. So you start at zero, and then you can jump with a certain probability P to the neighboring value. So if you start at zero, you can jump to one with probability P, or you can jump on the left with probability Q. So now P plus Q has to be one. Okay, because the, 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 well, it doesn't have to be one, but we'll take it to be one. P plus Q is one, so you always jump. So Q is one minus P. Okay, so there's only one free parameter here, which is P. So this is a kind of representation of the random walk, and then you can go, you can jump to the other integers like this. Three. Okay, and this is this is what also it's called the, the drunken uh, man walk. Uh, so really I'm jumping with some probabilities, either left or right. And this is taken as a as a basic models of different things in physics, like for instance, protein diffusions or, or um, other, other systems. This is a kind of real space diagram of what the random walk is. I have the different states and I can jump from one state to another with probability P and Q. In terms of the Markov diagram, what I have is very similar. I have the state zero, I have the state one, and then so on. I have an infinite number of states on that side. And I also have a state minus one, a state minus two, and I have other states on that side. I have a probability P of going from going right in terms of number and probability Q of going like this. So Q is the jump to lower values, P is the jump to higher values. And then I would have other arrows here, P and then Q. I can write the matrix pi, the matrix pi will be a doubly infinite matrix, so it's infinity by infinity. I cannot really write it down, but I can write it down in terms of, in, in a kind of abstract way. I have a bunch of zeros in the diagonal, and I have a bunch of p's in the upper diagonal, and a bunch of q's in the lower diagonal. Okay, because I move up with probability p, and I move down with probability q. So that's a big matrix. How do you find a stationary vector of that infinite matrix? Well, you can solve the equation related to this because even though pi is an infinite matrix, there are only two possible values. So when you look at the evolution equation, you don't have an infinite number of equations, you just have two equations. So here, if I write down Pn is equal to Pi, then I get that Pn plus 1 at the state i. In order to be at the state i, I can either come from below i minus 1, or I can come from above Pn i plus 1. So this is the equation. So even though my pi is infinite dimensional, and so is the vector of probabilities, really all that it says is this equation. So I can solve this equation and find here there's no station probabilities actually because I, I move with uh, all the time either left or right. So here in fact it's a kind of uniform, but uh, we're not going to discuss that. Okay, so this is this is a basic model. You you can try to simulate this very quickly. Uh, it's very easy to simulate because what you do is that you put yourself in some integer like usually at the origin, so you're at zero, and then you're just flipping a coin. A bias coin to determine whether you go left, left or right. Okay, so if the coin is biased with probability p, then you could say, oh, if the, the coin is head, I'm going to move in that direction. If it's tail, I'm going to move in the other direction. Good. Okay. So have a look at the section on application. Um, and then you have more applications. There's uh, I, I discuss also the population model. I discuss something about absorbing Markov chain, uh, counting Markov chain. And then later on, actually, I have a section on random walk on graphs. And then I have a section on um, how to calculate eigenvectors. But we'll cover this actually on Friday, this idea of random walk on graphs. 
Now I have a question here, which is, can we say something about ergodicity of the chain by looking at the transition matrix? The answer is yes. Again, this property of having a stationary distribution comes from what really you have in your big matrix pi. Okay. Um, if you have a big matrix, it's not like you can look at it and, and say, oh yes, I can see it. You know, it's like linear algebra. It's not, if you have a matrix, it's kind of difficult to see what the eigenvectors are, what the eigenvalues are. And so you, you'd rather go into an explicit calculation. You try to find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. And so one way to, to determine whether you have a ergodic process is, as we discussed before, you get all of the eigenvalues of the matrix pi and the corresponding eigenvectors. And if all the eigenvalues except the dominant one, which is one, have uh, smaller models, then in that case, in most cases, you have an ergodic chain. Otherwise, it's more complicated, actually. Um, often you can see it from the Markov diagram, whether you have an ergodic Markov chain or not. And for small matrix pi, you can kind of see it, but for larger one, it's just impossible to determine whether you have ergodic or not. Okay. So there are many examples. You can cook up many examples of Markov chains that are not ergodic, non-stationary, and so on. But again, all the examples that we'll see, um, most of the examples we'll see are ergodic uh, Markov chains. And then when we move on to John processes and stochastic differential equations, I will also make that claim that we'll be dealing with ergodic processes in general. Okay, so that, that notion of ergodic processes is not special to Markov, but we're, we're seeing this in the context of Markov. Now, remember again that the, the special property of a Markov chain is that property of the distribution. The probability to reach a state at time n only depends on where you were at the previous time step. That's the Markov property. Okay. You can imagine other stochastic processes where the probability to be at some state in time depends on the whole history say like weather. The probability of raining today is not just whether it was raining or sunny yesterday. It depends on the season too. So there's, there's a long correlation in the probabilities, but the Markov chain, the model of a Markov chain does not have this. The probabilities of sitting in some state only depends on which state you visited before. Okay. Good. Um, I think I'll stop here again. So I guess what you, you, you could do now, um, if you wanted to just go deeper into this is have a look at chapter one in order to get more information about probability and statistics, and then start reading chapter two about Markov chain. But again, what I presented is only a sub part of these notes. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you to read all the notes. It's just, it's gonna to be too much work. So stay with what we have there, go over the notes and then see what we've seen and then connect this to what I've written on the board um, and, and then start doing the exercises. So in the checklist for the school, I've, put, I've selected one exercise, one question from the exercise of uh, chapter one to kind of have a look at. There's too much problems actually for chapter one for you to do. Uh, unless you want to do them. And then the solutions again are, are in the Dropbox folder. Uh, but have a look rather at chapter two and then I've selected one question from the coursework sheet of chapter two for you to do. And again, the solutions are there on the Dropbox. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email um, and, and I'll be available actually all the week. And then we'll continue like this tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on different topics. Good. Um, Yes, um, so I can take some questions now. I think we have like five minutes um, or, or the time you need, uh, or otherwise we can. Okay, so there's a question from Jitandra. There's a, you can unmute yourself and ask a question if you want. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, hi. Like, uh, I had two questions. One is, uh, so the Markov chain itself has this structure of stationarity built into it, the stationarity in the sense of, uh, like if you take a correlation of xt and xt plus n, then it will only depend on n instead of t. Yeah. It's a built-in uh, property property of the Markov chain. Uh, no, it's not a built-in property. It's what I said before that if, if I take a, a correlation function, <coughs> of xn and then say um, n plus h. So you're looking at correlation like further down in terms of h. If the Markov chain is time homogeneous, 
This does not depend on n; it only depends on h. A uh, time homogeneous would mean the probability. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. The pi itself is independent of time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So pi i j, if you look at this, it doesn't depend explicitly on time. You have probabilities of jumpings that are explicitly not dependent on time. So if you have this, then any correlation function will only depend on the time difference, not on the actual absolute time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And uh, the other question is, uh, like, uh, one of the person asked, uh, pi inverse does it hold any meaning? But uh, what about time reversed uh, Markov chain? Wouldn't pi? Uh, time reversal actually will relate to pi, but not pi minus one. Oh. I, I, and like, how would it uh, like go? I mean, it, wouldn't it? Sh shouldn't it be di directly be pi inverse in a sense? Uh, because pi n plus one is pi n uh, p n times pi, then the reverse yeah. uh, p n plus one pi inverse p n equals to p n, right? So, yeah. But you see, so so I, I do have this equation, and it's a good point. Actually, you might think, oh, this is the forward equation. Let me let me build the backward equation for this, and then you would think, oh, okay, so the p n then will be if I multiply here on the side with p minus one, then it was going to be like Pn here with the pi minus one, right? Yes. So the thing is that this actually, and it doesn't work really for ergodic process because you see an ergodic process is a process for which from any initial distribution, you converge to P star. So this is, this is a dissipative evolution. You have a many to one evolution where many distribution converge to the same distribution. So they cannot be an inverse evolution. So what you'll realize is that pi minus one in, in most cases actually does not exist. There's no, there's no inverse evolution because the forward evolution is contractive. And this is very important. And it's, it's, it's not related per se to time reversibility. If we have time on Friday, I'll, I'll touch on time reversibility. But it, time reversal, um, the, the time reversal property is not related to pi minus one. It's not related to the inverse. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's another question here from Fabien. When using Hilbert space and QM in quantum mechanics, do we describe non-Markovian models? Uh, no, being non-Markovian means something else. Being non-Markovian in the context of Markov processes or stochastic processes would mean that your evolution is not Markovian. So it being the, the probability of reaching a state is not dependent only on the previous state. That's the Markov property. So being Markovian would mean, for instance, the probability of being in a state depends on the history, the full history of the process. So it depends on, uh, the, 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 uh, on, on 10 previous time steps and so on like this. Um, so this is non-Markovian. I wouldn't use the word non-Markovian in the quantum mechanics context. Quantum mechanics is a linear theory, but it doesn't have a kind of Markov property built in into it. It's something that we call the Sunny group property rather. So I wouldn't use the word Markov in, in this because I think, although I've put some similarities at the beginning, they're very different, right? In quantum mechanics, we're not dealing with a state in time. There's no state in time. There's just a wave function. And then we have a linear evolution of that wave function. You could say that the evolution is Markovian in the sense that it's given by a linear equation, but I think it's pushing the, the terminology a bit too much. There's a question, how applicable Markov process is for real system? Is it, ju is it just good for modeling? Uh, this is a very good question. It's good for modeling. Um, and, and I think it touches on a very deep aspect actually in the way that we do physics versus the way people use mathematics and applied maths. So I would say, I'm a physicist actually, I did physics, but now I work more in applied maths. I think when we write an equation in physics, we always believe that that equation is the true evolution. So for instance, if you write uh, Schrodinger's equation, we, we, we picture that equation as being the real evolution of a wave function in nature. Okay, so we've touched on something fundamental in nature, and then we don't see this as a model. We see this as describing what nature is. When you use Markov processes, the, the, the approach is a bit different. I think the approach is more in the sense of modeling something given limited information, given limited knowledge of what the system is. The system is stochastic, not fundamentally, but it's stochastic because we have limited information about this. And take, for instance, weather prediction as an example. 
weather prediction, the weather system on the planet is, we think, physically described by deterministic equations, but we never do weather prediction in a deterministic way because we don't measure everything. So we built a stochastic model of the prediction to give probabilities of different forecasts. Now we can take Markov process as the basic model. That will be a good toy model to describe weather forecast. And, but this is not a fundamental model. It, we don't see the model as representing reality. It's just a model. So there are good models. Whether they represent reality is something else. And I think you should think about this this week. This will be very important. As we move along to jump processes and stochastic differential equation, you have to think, do they really represent something physical? In many cases, the answer is yes, but not at the fundamental level. They just a kind of mesoscopic or coarse grain or kind of rough description of what's happening, but the model is very good for making prediction. Good, I hope this answers the questions. Then there's another question from Ivan Lubaskin. Can the pair of Frobenius theorem be used to prove ergodicity? Yes, that's exactly the result that we need. So if you go into that long abstract section in the, in the notes about classification of states, then you'll see that this is all related to pair of Frobenius. Um, and, and so you have basic theorems of linear algebra to tell you whether a, a, a given matrix pi is ergodic or not. And it, it touches on this idea of pair of Frobenius. It ties into pair of Frobenius because the matrix pi is positive. So it's a positive matrix and the basic results about positive matrices are covered by pair of Frobenius. Um, good, good. Okay, so um, these are the questions I see in the, in the chat, but again, feel free to send me questions by email. Um, it will be nice to all see you in person and see actually to how many people I speak to. I see 120, uh, uh, but this is all abstract to me because I don't. I see Sanjib and Abhishek. There's also a question now from Ah oh, Tridib. Hi Tridib. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Hugo. So I wanted to. I understand whether I understood your two examples clearly. So about this um, about the ergodicity. So the first example, uh, was it the case where there is a unique stationary state, but there are no limiting distribution? Is that correct? Because uh, first for the uh, half half as the largest eigenvalue state, whereas you start with one zero initial state, it will switch to this is the periodic Markov. So you'll switch. So that's the first example. And the second one is that it if, for example, if you take any many number of absorbing states, then uh, your stationary state would be degenerate. So you put just the fact that there are no unique stationary states, so that would break the ergodicity. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first example is a, an example of periodic Markov chain. So it's just like switching, and the the the, the distribution uh, 0.5.5 is stationary, but it's the only one. Yeah. Uh, and you're not reaching it from any other distribution. So it's not ergodic because it's periodic. The yes. other one is just the, the identity Markov chain. Whatever you start with, you just continue having this. So there's not even an absorbing state there. You just, I mean, because it, it's absorbing in the sense that if you start somewhere, you just stay there. Right. And then you have an infinite number of stationary distribution. Any initial distribution is stationary but it's not reached by, they're, they're not communicating. So you, you're not reaching a, there's, there's no unique stationary distribution that you can reach from any initial stationary distribution, any initial distribution. Okay, okay. So just uh, on the same question. So uh, the Peron Frobenius by itself would not then decide whether it is ergodic or not because Peron Frobenius, yeah, okay. Uh, so you need these notions of, so the, the two notions that you need for the classification of states are communicating states, um, periodicity and 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 uh, recurrence. So an ergodic Markov chain is a aperiodic uh, 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 aperiodic communicating Markov chain. Okay, so it's quite technical if you want the conditions, but yes, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's a question from Aniket. What is the difference between physics ergodic theorem and Markov chain ergodic theorem? I would say it's the same. 
and I'll just uh, maybe write something on the board. In physics, we say if a system is ergodic, then it reaches an equilibrium state, that's true. But in Markov process, the stationary distribution resulting from ergodicity is further classified in equilibrium and non-equilibrium. Okay, so that's a good point. I, I hope I'll have time to discuss this in the week. Um, but at least we, we have more words to describe in physics what we see in terms of Markov processes. So um, let's start with ergodicity. So if you have a Markov chain that's ergodic, we have that P star, which is unique, and then any PN will reach that P star, which is ergodic. Okay, so that's ergodicity. It means also in terms of expectation that if you take any kind of sum like this of the state, then by the ergodic theorem, what this means is that this will converge to the ergodic average. So this will converge to the ergodic average. So this is the ergodic theorem. And I think we use this a lot in physics. If you do a kind of time average, so an observation, which is a time average, if the system is ergodic, then in the long time limit, the time average converges to the ergodic average. So this is the ergodic theorem. So I think that answers maybe the first point that you, you mentioned there. And then the second point is about what is an equilibrium state or non-equilibrium state? And this has to do with the nature of P star. It's quite difficult for me now to explain what this is, but in physics, there's a further classification. So an ergodic or a stationary distribution can be equilibrium or non-equilibrium. And there's something called stationary non-equilibrium. And this has to do with the conditions of condition of detailed balance and reversibility of the Markov chain. Uh, but I, I can't go into this. I, I was actually planning to discuss this on Friday, so maybe I'll do this on Friday and then we'll get back to this. Maybe this is an important point. I was planning maybe Friday to discuss um, simulations, but maybe I can discuss simulations for half the time and discuss reversibility properties for the second half. And then we'll be touching on this idea of equilibrium and non-equilibrium distributions. Good. Okay, good. Other questions? I don't know how you guys are strict with time, if you want to stay here for another hour, or I don't mind, but... <laughs> uh, Hugo, I mean, I, I, uh, just related to comments. So, I mean, one way to maybe define uh, ergodicity also in a physical way is that you can go from any state to... Uh, yeah like any state, which also I think sort of connects to the fact that you have a unique invariant. Yes, so that in maths, this is called communication. So a state is communicating. So if the Markov chain is fully communicating, then um, this is, you have uh, ergodicity also. So it, essentially physically, I think that's the main point. So this is a, a good comment, uh, Abhishek. If you can go from any state to any other state with some non-zero probability, then in most cases you're ergodic. Right. But, but without having uh, cycles, you, you don't want to be periodic. So that, that breaks down ergodicity, but yeah. Good. Uh, is this related to fixed point and phase space? It is related to fixed point, but it's not a fixed point in phase space. It's a fixed point in distribution space, right? Because the ergodic distribution is a stationary distribution of the matrix phi. So it is a fixed point. It's a fixed point of the evolution equation. But remember, the evolution equation is an evolution equation for distributions. So we're talking about evolution of distribution in the space of distribution. So the stationary distribution is a fixed point in the distribution space. So it's not in the phase space. Phase space will be something like uh, position momentum, and then you have a fixed point in, in terms of position, like the pendulum, for instance, a pendulum with friction as a fixed point in terms of zero angle, zero velocity, any initial velocity, any angle, because of dissipation, we'll just put the pendulum down to the zero angle, zero velocity. That's a fixed point in state. But here now we'll be putting probabilities onto the state. So everything is described in terms of probabilities that evolve in time. And the station distribution is a fixed point in probability space. Good, good. 
I think this is working well. You can tell me in the comments in the in the chat section if the video was clear enough, if you could see the writing, if I need to write bigger, if I need to talk slower, just let me know and then I can adjust uh, for tomorrow. Hugo, I have a question about this convention. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah. So usually physics, you describe this P as a column vector and then this matrix works from the left, right? So is there any yeah. uh, cultural reason for in math it's uh, doing the other way or? No, there's no reason. I mean, that's the usual thing that maths will do one way and then physics will do one way. But maybe it's important for me to actually emphasize what you mean by this and what convention we use and whether the convention doesn't matter at all. Yeah, as long yeah. as you... So maths will have that convention that 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 pn is a row vector. So you have pn1, pn2. So it's a row vector. And so the evolution equation is as a row vector. So that's because pi i is the probability to go from i to j. And so the normalization property of pi is that you have to sum over the columns to get one. Now in physics, they just transpose everything. I guess, I guess in physics, we like evolution by taking column vectors because we always actually represent state vectors as column vectors. And yeah. that's the reason they, they chose row vectors. Uh, there's no advantages. Um, so here what we have now is Pn will be a column vector. I guess except writing in LaTeX, maybe just when you write manuscript, it's easier to write uh, this. Yeah, I don't know who started this, this fashion in math then. So then the, I'm going to write then Pn plus 1, you see, I'm going to write it as pi tilde, because it's going to be a different pi, right? because it's going to be the transpose. And so here, I'm multiplying on this side. Okay, so this will be the physics notation. Then that pi tilde ij is actually not ij, but it's ji. So you really transpose the two. So this is the probability to go from i to j. So this is really, you transpose pi and then you take ij. Okay, uh, no, no, sorry. So this is ij. Yeah. This is J I. Yeah. Okay, so it's just the transpose of everything. So here now the 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 the, the, the normalization of that stochastic property of this is that you have to sum over all the i's in order to get one. So here we have the columns of the rows of pi sum to one. Here we have the columns of pi summing to one. So I have actually this table in the notes. I just didn't write it on the board, but it's in the lecture notes for chapter two. Okay. We'll have the same actually convention coming from jump processes, and then it's going to disappear for stochastic differential equation. But yeah, um, good. Uh, could you repeat about Abhishek's comment? Does fully connected Markov process imply ergodicity? Not necessarily, because think about this one. Think about this example. This is fully connected, but it's 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 periodic. So you want fully connected, but not with ones. You don't want any periodic, you don't want any cycle. So if you're fully connected without any cycle, then you are ergodic. Good. There's a uh, Omer has a question, I think. Omer Granek. Yeah. Um, I just to make sure I'm not sure I followed completely. So uh, for a generic Markov chain, which is not necessarily ergodic, there exists an eigenvalue one with an eigenvector, but this uh, is not necessarily the limiting distribution. How can you show? that the rest of the eigenvalues are greater than one. Oh, well, sorry, smaller than one. Uh, so this should follow probably from the row uh, property of the, of the stochastic well, matrix. Yeah. So if you're able to get all the eigenvalues, you will always have that eigenvalue one. 
because that's the stochastic property of the maker. But as we, as we mentioned, that we haven't proved this and that we would have to check a few things, but I think it's true. If you have all the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues can be complex, but if they have modulus strictly smaller than one, I think you'll have a relativity. Okay, so the ordering property is, is equivalent to ergodicity, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Following statement, correct. Equilibrium systems are ergodic, but the ergodic system may not necessarily be equilibrium. Yes, yes. So, well, there's another issue about non-equilibrium meaning too many things, but stationary non-equilibrium is a kind of ergodicity, but uh, that has something else about detailed balance. So you can have ergodic systems that are equilibrium and non-equilibrium. Um, so an equilibrium system would be ergodic, but you can also have non-equilibrium systems that are ergodic. It's just that there's a different properties that um, um, make them different from equilibrium systems. And that property is the detailed balance property. Okay, again, I'll try to, come to, to cover this on Friday as an extra topic. Um, we could do a whole course actually on equilibrium versus non-equilibrium. I don't even teach the stuff in this course. Good. Good. Have a look again at the exercises. Um, the exercises, again, are, are too big for what we'll be covering this week. But if you're interested, have a look. If you want to learn more, have a look there. There's quite a lot of exercise, especially on numerical simulations. And again, I put all the solutions as Python notebooks on Jupyter. So I think they're, it's fairly self-explanatory, actually, the way I do the simulations. The simulations are never very difficult anyway, uh, but there's lots of interesting stuff. Um, I believe that the best way to really understand Markov processes is, is to go and trying to simulate Markov processes. So now think about the Markov chain, the two-state Markov chain, and then try to think, how can we simulate this? How can I simulate trajectories of a Markov chain? How can I calculate the stationary distribution? This is explained in the lecture notes, and this is covered in some of the exercises of the core sheets for the, each of the chapters, but I won't have time to cover everything. I'll try to give you some indications about simulations on Thursday and Friday, but this is a rich topic. We could do also a whole class only on simulation techniques. Uh, but once you start simulating, I think it really goes at the heart of understanding what Markov processes are. If you can simulate a Markov process, for sure you understand what a Markov process is. Yeah, I guess we stop here today.